Good evening and welcome to Direct Impact Broadcasting, the station of growth and transformation. Affiliate of Creative Broadcasting presents Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson with your host, Taiwana Wilson, as she welcomes her guest to the studio. Welcome to Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson. I am your host, Taiwana Wilson. A little bit about myself. I am your award-winning leadership maven, medical laboratory sciences by background, best-selling author, founder and CEO of Trendy Elite Coaching and Consulting Services, executive director with the John Maxwell team, and Maxwell Disc Certified Consultant. Before we bring on my special guest, I want to share a few announcements I am booking guests for this podcast through the remainder of 2020. So if you have a leadership message that you want to share, you can go on to directimpactbroadcasting.com to submit your interest. Once you're on the page, you will find a link up under the contact link that says Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson Guest. We have a few new podcasts on the network, one of them called SOS for Leaders, offering you practical strategies that you can use in both your personal and professional life, as well as elaborate topics. Podcast is catered towards medical laboratory professionals, offering them leadership and technical tidbits that they can use both inside and outside of the lab. It's not too late to get your personalized leadership assessment. All of them are on sale at TrendyEliteLLC.com. Today's special guest, Ms. Erica Fulton. Erica is a native of Houston, Texas. She has over 14 years' experience working with youth and adolescents. She is a member of the Professional Women's Group and a member of the Texas LPC Intern Association. She graduated with a dual degree in 2016 from Houston Graduate School of Theology and hold a Master of Arts in Counseling in preparation for the LPC LMFT licensure and her Master of Divinity. Erica graduated magnum cum laude with both masters with a 3.87 GPA. Her husband died almost 12 years ago, and she, while she was working on her undergraduate degree in theology, She eventually started working a part-time job to finish up her degree, even through through this painful loss. While at the University of St. Thomas, she was a student leader, and on campus, she made the dean's list twice. Her faith has given her the strength to withstand the storms of her life. She is an intercessor and a preacher. Erica graduated from UST in 2012. When she reflects on her grief journey, she is not bitter but grateful. This experience laid her groundwork for her to become a wounded healer and touch the lives of others. Erica is bilingual and on the board of directors for GettingSorted.com. She is also one of the co-authors of the collaboration book, Empower. For more information, you can visit Erica at her website at www.thecomcorner.org. Good evening, good evening, Miss Erica Fulton. How are you doing? I am blessed, blessed, blessed. Awesome. Well, it is so great to have you on this evening and talk to you about your leadership journey and hear the interesting tidbits that you have to share with the listeners. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Yes. Can you share with the listeners a little bit about your leadership journey and how did you get to where you are today? My leadership journey started while I was at the University of St. Thomas. For me, that is where my cultivation came in of being a leader. I was the secretary of the Cairo Theology Club. I was a COC representative, the Council of Clubs. We had a meet; they had a meeting like once a month, and so basically, I represented our organization. So it really taught me how to multitask, 
uh, I was also a student, so it was juggling my student responsibilities, my extracurricular ac- uh, activities. But one of the things that taught me was that in the midst of going through any sort of trial, to reframe it and use it as an opportunity to develop a growth mindset. And so being involved as a leader while I was in the midst of a grief journey, it it helped me to, to cultivate my resilience and my tenacity because when you are a leader, even when tragedy occurs, you have to have the ability to be able to push through and press through and complete the task at hand. It doesn't mean you don't acknowledge what you're going through, but I just believe that helped to just cultivate the resiliency and the resourcefulness, which is one of the strengths I have today. And so that's one of the ways um, I believe my leadership was cultivated. It's been cultivated in my home church under my pastor, Troy Johnson, in terms of uh, doing the youth ministry. It's me and another lady, but he never once tried to micromanage. He said, this is this is you all's area of expertise, so you all make the executive decisions, and, and you both co-share the responsibilities. And that just further fueled and developed my leadership skills, my ability to be a team member, and I believe my ability to collaborate. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, when you are active in the church, it definitely gives you uh, opportunity to hone in on those leadership skills and to work with our youth and to inspire and empower them. And you're right, when you are, I like what you said about having the ability to push through and press through during those times of trials and leading. And and that's kind of what we're seeing now. We are in a trial uh, and there's you know, the negativity that's going on and, and the, the fallout with the pandemic and the, the crisis and all of that, but having that ability to be resilient during a time of, of chaos and, and trial is, is very important for leaders. Very important. Leaders come from all different backgrounds with different experience and different skill sets and strengths. So what do you feel has been beneficial for you to be able to thrive as a leader and open up doors for you to be successful? I think one of the strengths um, for me that has been a blessing God has gifted me with is resourcefulness. In my own personal life, I have had to learn uh, how to be very resourceful, and that has translated into helping me to learn how to think outside of the box. And I will go back to the youth ministry, that, which is in my home church, that very much a part of it, it has taught me to be able to work with the resources we had. And uh, one of the things my pastor always talked about is learning how to be grateful, with lip, be grateful even when it appears as if you have limited resources because that is an opportunity to really discover just how creative you can be. Uh, and, again, I just kind of segue just a tad bit in, into an a experience I had in my personal life, which actually helped to catapult me in a way into even the profession I'm in now. Being a member of the professional women's group as we dress for success, I was – I was looking for a way to be able to obtain my licensure, and I had just, I was just getting ready to be done with my residency, and I was steady looking for work, and I had been dealing with injuries and illness that started to hit me, but I go back to that resourcefulness, because what ended up happening was I was able to obtain a scholarship, which I in turn used to be able to pay for you know, all of the costs associated with my exams for both my NCE and my what they call my LCDC and exam, uh, LCDC and exam. And so, you know, I passed those on the first try, thank God. But I use that story as an example to say I worked with the resource I had. 
because I knew in order for me to do what I had been called to do and to be able to be effective in that, I needed these licensures. So I, I had to work with the resources I had. And so that has always been a main theme of my life, whether it be personal or professional, learning how to work um, with, with just resourcefulness and, and resiliency. And my resiliency, I believe, has come from my not just my grief journey, but I believe um, just coming from what I could have perceived as black. I could have looked at my background and said, oh, there's no way I can even do school for that matter. And my parents can't pay for this. But that's where my resourcefulness and my resiliency <laughs> kicked in because I was determined to be what I was created to be. And I looked at my environment and said, I want something different. I want something better. And not just for me, but for the generation that has to follow behind. I want to leave a legacy that will outlive me, so to speak. So those two elements have been so instrumental in shaping who I am on a spiritual, professional, and personal level. That's good. You would absolutely have to be determined to succeed, and as leaders, you're right, you have to make do or make the best out of what you have. I mean, we see it all the time in the workplace with our teams and, you know, with our, our budget. You know, you have to make do with sometimes your equipment or, you know, mm-hmm. things that you have. You have to make the best out of it and make it so that it works and you're still able to be successful. So I think being resourceful and resilient are great qualities and uh strengths to be able to have. We've all failed at one time or another, Erica. Can you tell us about one of your failures and the lesson you learned from it? Because it's important for our next generation of leaders as well as our young people to know Mm -hmm. that on our journeys it's not all been success. There has been Mm -hmm. some failures that we've all encountered. So can you share with the listeners a little bit about one of your failures and what you learned from it? I recall my very first year I was straight I went straight from high school to college. And part part of my problem was I went to college but my mentality didn't didn't shift. And so what ended up happening was they kept giving me warnings, look, if you don't stop, we're going to kick you out. And I did not take it to heart. I didn't take the warning seriously. And so what ended up happening was I, I, they kicked me out. I, I I don't know if flunked out would be a right word, but, you know, when I did not adhere to being put on probation, they suspended me. And so for a whole year I couldn't go back. And so for me – that was a major blow, and I'll go back just a bit, and I'll connect it. From an early age, I had teachers say to me, she's slow. You no, know, that she doesn't pick up, pick the material up as quite as quick as everybody. You know, you just might as well just hang it up with her. But the thing I loved about my grandmother, who's now deceased, and my mother, They both fought for me. My grandmother went up to that schoolhouse and said, oh, no, she yanked me out of there ever so quickly. But when that happened to me at at U of H, it it was almost as if for a minute, it was like, were they right? And it, it, it was a defining moment for me because I could have just walked away and said, you know, it's just not meant for me. And nobody would have stopped me because as an African American female, I defy the statistics and the odds, and I will again say, you know, I I credit that to my perseverance, but I also credit it to the God that I serve, and I'm never ashamed to speak on that, that even in that lowest moment, what helped me was him saying, you got to get back up, daughter. I know this may be, you may perceive this as a failure, but this can actually be the catalyst to get you where I need you to be if if you will embrace it and grow from it. And for a long time, I didn't really want to speak on it because it wasn't one of my 
mountain moments is what I call it. And I, I want to piggyback off of what you said, but people need to understand that being a leader is it, not the string of successes. You go through failures. But, but I would challenge that term we use, failure. Was it really a failure or was there a lesson in it that was needed for the next part of the journey? That had you not actually experienced the failure, maybe you would not have the success in your business you have now, maybe you wouldn't even have the marriage you have now. Maybe your faith would not even be where it was if you had not experienced what you perceived as a failure. And so for me, it actually caused me to do some some digging very deeply and some soul searching. And it made me have to shift. It made me have to shift how I manage my time, had to shift my priorities. But it was actually a blessing in disguise. I could see that back then. I can actually look at it now and see how that failure can help so many. And, again, I will go to the fact that as an African-American female who was raised by grandparents and a single mom and my dad wasn't there, I defied what the statistics said I was supposed to be. And I actually went beyond what was expected of me and I, I I actually thank God for the, the rough places and I thank God for the times of struggle because now they cause me to appreciate my mountain moments just a little bit more uh, if, if I may uh, may share something kind of connected back to that I recall when I was first looking for work as a in the counseling field It was very tough. It was very hard. And even with my LPC intern license, I would say, well, I would say maybe a good two, three months. But I remember that that year when I had a lot of injuries, I would say about, I would say 2000, October 2018, I'd say kind of put it from there to October of 2019, even dealing with injuries and, and, you know, having to let my body heal and still trying to look for work. It, it again, that appeared like a setback to me. And it I, I had frustrating moments when I just felt like just Erica throw it. <laughs> I just felt like wanting to throw in a towel and God would bring me back to that moment and say, you remember what you thought was a failure? Now, you press your way through that, you can press your way through this, daughter. He always, when he speaks to me, he says that word, daughter. So I actually look at my setbacks and my and, and what some could call as a failure. It, it actually, it fueled my desire to, just continue to move forward. And I believe it was not just for me, but it was for people who would be hearing my story to know that failure is not the end all. It's not the end of the story. And, again, what's the lesson hidden in it for the next part of the journey? Absolutely, absolutely. I I love that. A, A failure can be your catalyst that you need to use it so that you can grow and help you move forward to the next part of the journey. That's, that's good. Mm -hmm. So what has success taught you? So we talked a little bit about those learning lessons Mm -hmm. of, uh, of failures or some mistakes, but what has success taught you? Success has taught me consistency. You have to be consistent. I recall when I first started with the the comcorner.org, the com corner, I I remember writing blogs many days and not really knowing if people were reading, if people were leaving care. And just yesterday, uh, I, I, I connected with someone via LinkedIn. And so she said, well, I read some of your publications, and she said, I just added your website to our list of grief recovery resources. And for some people, they would say, oh, this is not a big deal. For me, that was a major deal. 
that was so huge for me because I can recall a year and a half ago just having to be consistent. My sweet sister said to me, you have to be consistent. You know, you have to put those blogs out, excuse me, every single week, even if you may feel as if no one is, excuse me, listening. So success has taught me consistency. Success has also taught me about the importance of self-care because you cannot pour from an empty cup. You can't hold space for anybody else if you do not allow someone or or some people use the word higher power. I say if I don't allow God to hold space for me. So success has taught me consistency. You have to have self-care. Because without self care, you you can't sustain you cannot sustain the success. The other thing success has actually taught me is to not make success the core of my identity. Because if you do that, then I do not want to say you necessarily set yourself up for failure. But if you make success just the core of who you are then when setbacks do occur, you will find yourself questioning your own ability. So I've had to learn to actually not put my identity in my successes. My identity goes beyond that. It is because of who I am and God that actually provides the strength I need that that causes me to be successful, and then everyone has different definitions of successful. What I call successful, success for me, is being and doing at the end of the day what I was created to do. Some people define success by big houses, cars, and that's a part of it. But if that's your total basis of it, there are a lot of people who have houses, cars, and $10 million, and they are miserable. So that can't be the end off of success. I believe it has to be something deeper. I, has, I believe it has to be beyond the, beyond the tangible, what we can see. So I have had to learn within the context of my faith to redefine success, and that, that actually helps me to stay in the realm of success. Even when failure occurs, I still have to remember I'm not what is happening to me. Because, again, if I make success just the total core of who I am, then when any setback comes, any failure, then it, I will forever be tossed and turned by every wave. And so I've had to learn to not define myself in those terms and to also know what success means to me. That's good. That's good. You're right. Success, it looks different for everybody. It feels different for everybody, and you have to define it for yourself. So I I like that you said it teaches you how to be consistent. You know, being consistent is is huge. It's a major thing. And the reason why mm-hmm. some people don't succeed is because they're not consi- because they're not consistent. Right? You know, mm-hmm. or they don't go to the next level or move into a, a position they've been trying to get or whatever the case may be is because they've not been consistent in what it takes to get there. Whether that's with their education whether that's networking and meeting new people, whether that's getting involved, or whatever the case may be. So I, I like that you said that, that success is not just about the what you see, the, the tangible house, car, you know, that kind of thing. As we know, Erica, growth is intentional. So what do you do for your own professional and personal growth? Like what books do you like to read? What do you do to keep yourself growing? Well, there's a book I'm cur- currently reading. Um, you know, and this is a therapist in me. There's this thing called bibliotherapy, which is sometimes you assign your clients to read a book. And so mm-hmm. a, book, a, book, a good book I would recommend for any leader is Hind's Feet on High Places. That's actually my current read. It has been very therapeutic. 
it has caused me to do self-examination. And I recently actually did a blog. And one of the things I say is that when we don't check our souls, we can end up walking around with all kinds of infections. And when I thought of this initially, I thought of it in the natural. And I'm going to be quick with this illustration. We can get a scrape on our leg, and then we don't pay it any attention. And then three months later, say four months later, for some reason we have to go to the doctor. And that's like, what happened? And you go, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, we don't know what happened, but now you have an infection. And you say, infection? And at first you say, well, I don't know how that could have happened. And then you say, wait a minute. Two months ago, three months ago, I, I got a scratch. I didn't treat it. I didn't tend to the wound. And now the wound has turned into an infection. And I say that one of the ways I have to be intentional with my self-care, that's what I call it, self-care, which helps me to grow, is examining myself, reading books like Hind Sweet on High Places, Spirituality and the Awakening Self are two of the, my current reads, and I would recommend those books to anyone. Uh, Spirituality and the Awakening Self is by David G. Benner. That's one. I can I, I do not remember the author of Heinz V on High Places off the top of my head, but if you Google the title, the author should pop up. But Heinz V on High Places, to just make it brief, is about this character of Much Afraid, and she lives in the Valley of Humiliation. She wants to go to the high places. Shepherd wants to take her there. And most of why she says she can't go is not necessarily what people say. It's self-perception. So reading that book has had to make me say, Erica, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself within the context of your faith? Or are you seeing yourself by the opinion of other people? And the book has been just very therapeutic, and I just remind it for anyone who's at a, a point in their life where it's almost like a crossroads, and it's almost like you, you are being called to a, a higher place, a higher way of existing, of being. And that book has really challenged me to say, what, what are the self-perceptions that are keeping me from going to the high places? Not necessarily what people have said. Maybe what have I internalized? Sometimes we internalize things because of certain experiences we have. Sometimes our family background. All those different things factor into who we become. And so self-examination helps me to pull out the weeds and say, okay, what, what is my faith? And what is other people? And maybe even what is me? And to be able to remain clear on my identity and who I am. And I go back to that keeps me from not making success the essence of who I am because it allows me to be okay with failure and it allows me to be able to grow from it rather than beat myself down or belittle myself. So I definitely, that for me also prayer, meditation, I have my daily devotion. And one of the things that I've been reading, and I'm, and I'm probably going to meditate on my daily devotion when I get off here, is it says casting stones. And I really love the illustration. It was basically saying when we remember what we've been through and we remember who brought us through our trials, our tribulations, for me the things that God has done, I have a gratitude journal. And when I go back and I read that, I'm, I'm, ca- I'm counting my stones. And then that gives me strength to say, if within the context of my faith, the God that I serve brought me through that valley and gave me this mountain, and he brought me through this and helped me to overcome this struggle and this addiction, why would he not help me in this place? So bibliotherapy the prayer of meditation, those are the ways I have to replenish myself because in the field I'm in, counseling, any helping profession, I was a chaplain resident for a year, level one trauma hospital, and I had to do the same thing because as a helping professional, you pour out. You pour out. You listen to people all day. 
And you have to have a quiet space where your mind and your body can be able to just calm down and almost drown out the noise. Um, For me, when I come home from work, you know, taking a bath and not just sitting around in my work clothes, for me that's self-care because it makes me say, okay, work day is over. And I'm also in a doctorate program. So I definitely have to find ways to refuel and recharge myself. Also for me what helps me is using a planner because I've noticed if I don't track my time, it, it can cause me to become very anxious. So it it helps me to stay mindful of my time and and not let four or five hours pass. And then I'm like, oh, you know, I could have done my paper. I just use that as an example, X, Y, and Z. And so these are the things I do for growth, renewing my mind. With For me, with the word of God, I can't speak for other people. You know, for some people, it is the Quran. For some people who, who may practice Judaism, the Torah, but for me, it is my devotionals, my Bible, hind feet on high places, talking to my sister. Those are methods of self-care for me, censoring prayer, certain scriptures, journaling. Those are the ways, those are my methods of refueling and replenishment. That's good. We all have to have a way of refueling ourselves because as leaders, you are definitely pouring in to other people and pouring into their growth. And you're right. It can, the more you pour, sometimes it does feel like, it seems like the more you pour, the the less full uh, you feel. And, and it does get draining. And although we love what we do, we do have to take that time to to kind of replenish ourselves and center ourselves and, and reading your Bible, if that's what you uh, believe in, or journaling or meditation or whatever else is, is are all great ways to be able to do that. Erica, what part have coaches and mentors played on the progression of your career if any part. My um, one, I have so many, but one of the mentors that has played a major role in my life is my pastor who is also my father in the ministry. And just his, um, his, his example, how he, how he pastors us, his use of boundaries, just, him modeling those things has impacted me and helped me as a has impacted me as a leader. And so it's also my pastor. It's also my one of my supervisors when I was doing my practicum, Cheryl Ivory. She actually graduated from Houston Graduate School of Theology. She was the first to graduate with her Master of Arts in Counseling. So she's played a role. She's a pastor as well. So as you can tell, we have a lot in common. Sandra Warren, she's another LPCS supervisor who who poured into me when I did my practicum at Star of Hope. She is such a woman of faith, and she showed me how counseling and faith can coexist, that they don't have to be polar opposites or enemies. She showed me com- how to how to have compassion and empathetic understanding, but also she was very firm. That is one of the things I admired. So for me, mentors and coaches have really poured into me. There's an organization by the way of Inspire Women, and they were so instrumental even in me obtaining my degree. Just they were they are another form of spiritual replenishment. Their inner circles. That's another thing I do for self care. But they poured into me monetarily. Excuse me. And for that, I'm just so thankful. So, and and even my my theological foundation, because when I was doing my residency, they asked us, you know, who has who has shaped come to shape your your theological understanding. 
your understanding of God. And so one of the things my pastor taught me was this a long time ago, that to whom much is given, much is required, that people are not a means to an end. You don't use them for what you can get out of them. You serve them. And from that place of servanthood, God will bring the increase. And it's always stayed with me. It has always been people are not a means to an end. Watch how you treat people because those people that have been entrusted, at least, and I will go back to my, my faith, my belief system, that those whom we have been entrusted with as leaders, God holds us accountable for. At least I feel like I have a level of accountability. I have a level of accountability with my participants that I counsel. And so I'm very mindful of how I treat them. At least I strive to be. I try to be mindful. The other thing he taught me is ministry begins at home. Servanthood begins at home. Because if I am not walking in integrity with the people in my home, how can I expect to flow in what I've been called to do outside of the home? Because integrity is what you do when nobody's watching. And in this day and age, it, it, it almost scares me to see I just don't always see integrity with leaders, and it saddens my heart because it's not about a title. It's about serving, and, and I think we have to be mindful, and that's one thing my pastor taught me, serving. He, he is a servant at heart, and, and he is always um, – he was, he's, he's really he's been there for me just here recently in the in the midst of my mother's sudden passing. He's been just right there calling, checking on me, you know, helping me, you know, just navigate through some financial things that I know how to deal with. So him and and my my sister Kenya, she is my accountability partner. She keeps me accountable. She she keeps me in check is what I call it. You know, I can't get the big head with her because she'll lovingly tell me the truth, sis. And she will say, you were wrong for that. She's like, remember who you are. Remember the title you wear. And it, it, there will be times when I may have gotten a little upset, but when I said and I thought about it, I said, no, she's right. But she is really right. You know, so I I thank God for her because she keeps me accountable and rooted. And we have to have people in our lives who are not going to be enamored by us, that they're going to speak the truth to us in love. And so for me, all those individuals have poured in different ways and they play different roles, but they have formed uh, formed who I am both in my professional and personal life. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. You're right. We have to uh, be servant leaders, and we definitely have to be accountable. So as we get ready to wrap up our show for this evening, what tidbit of wisdom would you like to leave the listeners with that they could use in both their personal and or professional life? One of the tidbits I would leave is self-care. Self-care. You cannot pour from an empty cup. And if you try to pour from an empty cup, you'll drown you and everybody else. You cannot pour from an empty cup. Self-care. You you have to find ways to replenish yourself. You have to find ways to, to laugh, to learn how to see the joy in life. That's one of the one of the one of the tidbits of wisdom I would leave. The second thing I would say is that don't despise the small beginnings. Don't despise what seems like an insignificant call or what you may perceive as an insignificant call. Or you may say, Well, oh, you know, they want me to speak at this event but there's only five people. You speak and you give it your best as if it were 5,000 because if you're faithful over a little, then you'll be made rule over much. But if, if you can't even be faithful in those five people, and it goes back to being consistent, be consistent and don't be ruled 
by your emotions. We can't be ruled by our emotions because I don't feel. Emotions, they fluctuate. They come and they go. They, they, are, they are never a, 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 a good foundation to make an important decision. Don't ever make an important decision in the heat of your emotions or in the heat of your, in the moment or while you are in your emotions because then you're not, you're not taking everything into consideration. You're just taking your emotions into consideration in the moment. So to kind of just sum it up, I would say self-care. Make sure you are taking care of yourself. Um, I, I would say don't make an emotional decision in the heat of the moment. Be consistent and be prepared to work. Be prepared to work. You may have to work some long hours at first. You may have to work a job that you don't really like. So case in point, now I'm I'm very blessed that I my job is, you know, I really love it. And I'm about 1,400 hours in to 3,000. But I say that to say that I had some long nights in the beginning. And I, I had to work my way through that. But don't be afraid to take a job that you may feel is insignificant. Oh, this ain't really paying what I want. Work your way up because you don't know what lies ahead for you in that company. Don't don't despise the small beginnings because you don't know the blessing that's wrapped up in it. That's good. That's good. I think that's excellent advice because sometimes, uh, especially as the next generation of leaders, they may not want to take a certain position because they may say, well, this is too small or it's not in alignment. I'm trying to be the CEO, but yet there are steps in order to get to that level. So what's next for you, Erica? What is next for me? You know, I've been asking myself that question just as I have been, as I have been pondering and reflecting, I would say, on this past year and probably the year before. I know what's next is continuing to move forward with my doctorate, continuing for me to build myself up in my most holy faith, to continue to strengthen that part of my life because so many times we work on ourselves as professionals, but we don't work on our person. And if you don't work on your person, you can have it, you can know everything you need to know in your profession, but if you're not working on the person, that could be a dangerous thing. I'll just use myself as an example, and I think it will flow with that question, what's next? If I don't work on Erica the person, I can have all the clinical knowledge in the world. But Erica the person, that foundation has to, has, has to be solid. And so for me what's next is, like, as I stated before, continuing in my doctorate program. And I believe continuing to explore various ways in which I can engage in self-care, continuing to care for myself, mind, body, spirit, and soul. Uh, those are definite two things that are next for me. The other thing that is on the horizon for me is I'm excited is that I've been blessed, and I, I really say truly blessed, to be part of the collaboration with Janelle uh, Harris. It is called Stepping Into Your Territory, and I'm so grateful because I, I, I'm, I'm just great that this is a season in my life where I truly can see, I can see for me, for me, how the hand of God is ushering me into my territory. I can see how his hand has just been opening up these doors and just, just ushering so many things. And I got a call today that I didn't even expect. I was not not even looking for but I know it was God. And all I can do is be in awe and say thank you. 
excuse me, gratitude, counting my stones. No, stacking, stacking my stones. I'm sorry that was the name of the devotional. Stacking my stones, reflecting, remembering what my God has done for me. And so that's definitely next. That's the next in terms of writing, continuing to work on my own writing project that I hope to have done by the end of this year. And I will be on a show with Coach Roz, the Love Hour, this upcoming Sunday at 8 p.m. So that's what's next for me. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about the book collaboration because it is so prophetic of where God is taking me, and I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm just grateful, and I can't say uh, that enough. That's awesome. It sounds like you have some awesome things in store for your next with school and your collaboration project. So. Best wishes and stuff for you. That's awesome news. So how can the listeners stay connected with you and continue to follow you on your journey? Yes, they can go. I have an Instagram author, Erica Fulton. I also have my my website, thecomcorner.org. If anyone wants to purchase a copy of Empower, I have Cash App. I also have an online store, payhip.com. Slash Erica Denise Fulton, and also I have my email, which is thecomcorner.org at outlook.com. If people want to get in contact with me for speaking engagements, those type of events, any Zoom meetings, those are the different mediums through which they can contact me. Awesome. Well, our time tonight is coming to a close. I want to thank you so much for joining the show and taking the time out to give me the opportunity to interview you tonight. It was definitely an honor and a pleasure to learn about you and your journey, and many blessings and continued success on your journey ahead, Ms. Erica Fulton. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, listener audience, for tuning in to tonight's show with my special guest, Erica Fulton, where she shared with us that you have to have the ability to push through and press through, being resourceful and able to work with what you have. You have to be determined to succeed and also think about leaving a legacy, not just for you, but for the other leaders coming behind. A failure can be a catalyst that you can use to help you grow and help you move to the next level. Success teaches us to be consistent. We have to be consistent. It also teaches us the the importance of self-care, and we don't want to make success about the core of our identities. Evaluate how you see yourself. And you have to replenish. You cannot pour and continue to develop others and instill in others and empower others if you're pouring from an empty cup. Be prepared to do the work. And don't make decisions when you are emotional. So if you like what you heard tonight and want to listen to previous shows or even other shows that we have on the network, please subscribe at directimpactbroadcasting.com. If you are thinking about starting your own podcast, I would love, love, love to have your show on our network. You can send an email at info at directimpactbroadcasting.com to learn more, or you can fill out a form on the website. And please tune in next week to hear from another amazing leader. Until then, have a good evening. Thank you, friends, for tuning in to another episode of Leadership Tidbits with Coach T. Wilson, where Taiwana speaks with leaders who share nuggets of wisdom that you can use in your personal and professional life. Follow her on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Coach T. Wilson. Connect on LinkedIn or visit www.coachtwilson.com. And remember, in life, learn as much as you can, appreciate often, and lead fearlessly. 